A very good uh, morning to all colleagues, friends, uh, partners who have uh, joined us today for our webinar on protecting and empowering persons with disabilities in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Kaveh Zahidi. I am the deputy at the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. I would like to welcome you on behalf of all of my colleagues to our webinar on the protection and empowerment of persons with disabilities in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. This session has been organized by us at ESCAP with the support of the Special Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General uh, on Disability and Accessibility, Ms. Maria Soledad Cisternas Reyes, who we will hear from in a moment. Uh, before I continue, colleagues, let me take a tiny pause just to make sure that the YouTube uh, the, the, the YouTube link is working and visible. And maybe I'll look to colleagues to see whether I should start again. Okay, just to, just to err on the, on the side of caution and to make sure that nobody feels uh, left out in, in any way, let me again uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar on protecting and empowering persons with disabilities in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. As I said, my name is Kaveh Zahidi. I'm the deputy at UN ESCAP. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to the webinar uh, on the protection and empowerment of persons with disabilities. The session has been organized by uh, the team at UNSCAP with the support of the Special Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General on Disability and Accessibility, Ms. Maria Soledad Cisternas Reyes, who we're going to hear from in a moment. We're also fortunate to have an extraordinary lineup of pan panelists and discussants that I will introduce to you after Maria speaks. But first, uh, if you could just allow me to provide you a little context uh, for why we felt it so critical to organize this session during such uh, a challenging times and to bring together all of these experts, policymakers, change makers uh, that have been working on championing disability inclusive development in Asia Pacific and beyond. And really the, the, the reason is simple. Uh, while we all try to adjust to the new normal, for persons with disabilities, this adjustment is much harder and sometimes simply unattainable. How well suited has the response to COVID been for persons with disabilities? What does social distancing mean for people that rely on personal assistance? What does work from home mean for those that simply cannot? And as billions of dollars pour out in fiscal stimulus packages, how well are the needs of persons with disabilities, usually the most financially insecure, being met? And we hope that our panelists uh, can help answer some of these questions for us. But we all know that even before the pandemic, persons with disabilities faced barriers to full and effective participation in society. The COVID-19 pandemic has simply magnified existing poverty, magnified existing inequalities and vulnerabilities, and put the lives of people with disabilities at risk. And that is why for ESCAP, the promotion of disability rights and disability inclusive development has been a priority for more than three decades. The Incheon strategy to make the right real for persons with disabilities in Asia and the Pacific that was launched in 2012, along with its disability specific targets, disability specific development goals, has helped our member states to track progress towards improving the quality of life and the fulfillment of rights of our region's 690 million persons with disabilities. The Beijing Declaration and Action Plan adopted by our governments to and two and a half years ago now, it was another push towards realizing disability rights and disability inclusive development. And then with the advent of the system-wide United Nations Disability Inclusion, Inclusion Strategy last year, ESCAP has now entered a new phase in its disability inclusion efforts, characterized really by a, a whole of, of organization approach. 
And in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are now repurposing all of our work and mechanisms to continue to protect and empower persons with disabilities. And this webinar is just a small example of our efforts, in this case, to provide a regional platform for our governments and stakeholders to share early experiences and find some, some badly needed solutions for developing disability inclusive responses to COVID-19. Some of you were either involved or would have seen our policy brief on ensuring disability rights and inclusion in the response to COVID-19 that identified some really some minimum standards in the early days of this pandemic, including standards on consultation and partnership with persons with disabilities, on providing access to goods and services, on the delivery of public information in accessible formats, on making medical and quarantine policies and processes accessible and disability inclusive, on safeguarding income security and livelihoods, and on protecting the rights and well-being of persons with disabilities living in institutions and facilities. These recommendations provide really a framework for developing disability inclusive responses to COVID-19. How much are they being applied? Well, let's drill down on that deeper during the webinar today with our panelists and participation uh, and participants. Now, with the context set, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Ms. Maria Soledad Cisternas Reyes, who is, she is the Special Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General on Disability and Accessibility. And Ms. Cisternas was chairperson of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities of the United Nations. She's a recipient of the National Prize of Human Rights. She also served as an expert before the ad hoc committee that actually developed the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, for which she is also the rapporteur for individual complaints. And above and beyond it all, she is an extraordinary champion for disability inclusive development. So uh, uh, Maria, if I could hand over to you for your keynote speech, and it's with a great pleasure that I do so. Thank you very much. A good morning, everyone over there, and good evening here in my country, 10 o'clock. <laughs> and for me, it's a great pleasure to share with all of you. And I would like to recognize the real commitment of you, Mr. Cabez said, as uh, the chief of the team with uh, your permanent commitment with the with persons with disabilities and different topics about these sectors of the population and uh, when i propose the this seminar you respond immediately uh, and now we have the possibility to share with the audience, and thank you very much to the audience for the participation, to speak about different aspects in relation to persons with disabilities and the pandemic. First, I would like to remember that we have two main instruments, CRPD, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability of United Nations, and the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development. And I would like to underline that the pandemic no suspend the application of CRPD and no suspend the application of 2030 Agenda. On the other hand, there is a reality before the pandemic and other quite different after the pandemic. I am sure that, in a, that the, our future will not be the same without COVID-19. And in relation to persons with disabilities, it is very important to be clear the diagnosis because the pandemic affects 
the civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. And in this order, as a special envoy, I elaborated some statements with different important topics in relation to persons with disabilities. First, with the chairpersons of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities about the impact in the life of persons with disabilities with the pandemic, a touching a, the aspect of the health care in health centers and the needs of the treatment, medicines, and the inclusion of support for the life of persons with disabilities, the training of the staff in relation to the treatment for persons with disabilities. But at the same time, we uh, touch the topic, the topic of quarantine because persons in general suffer the restrictions of the liberty. And in the case of persons with disabilities, the situation is uh, more hard for this reason it is very important to ensure persons with disabilities in relation the provision of the water, foods, medicines, personal assistance, rehabilitations, to be a continuum of services in relation to these provisions. The third aspect is taking account the policy brief of the Secretary General of the United Nations because he underlined the inequality of persons with disabilities before the pandemic and the situation of the mass marginalization increasing in this moment with COVID-19. Excuse me. And in this sense, Secretary General recommend to put in the center of our concern the situation of persons with disabilities to get an inclusive response to the pandemic for persons with disabilities, based in some pillars. First, no discrimination. Second, intersectionality because it is necessary to cross the perspective of persons with disabilities with gender, childhood, aging, poverty, and other different circumstances. A third is the full participation of persons with disabilities and their representatives, organizations with incidents in the public policies to give a real response for the needs of persons with disabilities. Other aspects that he mentioned is the data collection because it is very important the segregated data in relation to persons with disabilities, sex, gender, age, poverty, rural or urban areas, etc. And the topic of accountability. And I would like I, I would like to emphasize that when the pandemic will finish, it will be necessary that the state parties report to the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Here is Monty Ambuntan, my colleague in the comment, in the committee, uh, to, 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 to present the report to the committee. And in relation to the high level political forum, the report in relation to social development. For this reason, I think that is very important to take the experience during the pandemic, because the pandemic showed us that the Convention and the 2030 Agenda need to progress 
in the fulfillment. And taking this, this experience, it is important to, to plan the future in relation to the fulfillment of, of the rights of persons with disabilities in the line to create an inclusive, sustainable, and accessible society with full participation of persons with disabilities. To finish, I would like to emphasize the importance of the politic decision the politic decision in the level of the state's parties and the agencies inside the state parties. I, I mean the Ministry of uh, Health, Education, so, Social Development, etc. Second, the politic uh, decision of the local and regional authorities in city halls in urban areas and rural areas for their special connection with the citizens, including persons with disabilities, and the political decisions of the organization of persons with disability to fight, to put on a table their needs. We need to come with the commitment of private sector, obviously, and other stakeholders, and it is important to begin the dialogue now. Thank you very much. Gabe. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. We're, thank you for, for staying up so late to, to, to join us. Thank you for, for really spurring us into action on this webinar. And especially thank you for, for reminding us uh, of, of, of something absolutely vital, that the pandemic in no way means the suspension of CRPD, of the of the move to implement and accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as it applies, of course, to persons with disabilities. And much of this was underlined in the Secretary General's uh, policy brief that you kindly referred to, uh, as well as the detailed chair statements of the committee of, of the CRPD. And all of this material is available, and I'm going to give people the link to the website at the end of this session. But again, thank you so much, uh, Maria, for your keynote speech and your opening words. Thank you. Uh, with that said, uh, we would now like to uh, hear a little bit more uh, from persons with disabilities uh, uh, in, in our region in a, in a short video that has been put together by the team called Leave Us Not behind. So if I could turn over to the colleagues for the short video. 690 million persons with disabilities in Asia Pacific already excluded before COVID-19. The disability community faces new normals. COVID-19 is our new reality. I can't afford to get infected. COVID-19 infection no money, no food, no medicine, no soap. Everything stopped. What if my parents die? This lockdown has been so difficult for Naim who has autism. He has broken his iPad and his keyboard just because of this. COVID-19 information for the public is not always made accessible to persons with disabilities, especially those of us who rely on the use of computer screen reading software. Persons with psychosocial disabilities who are institutionalized are at much greater risk. They have access to a very few amount of information. All health systems are stretched. Tough call, who to save and who to let die. We have crippling expenses and empty coffers. It is now so difficult to raise funds. Adapt to thrive. 
In Bangladesh, CDD and many other organizations of persons with disabilities distribute relief packages, create awareness and promote teletherapy in community for our fellow persons with disabilities. But the good thing is that we have a long-term partnership with the Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief and they have issued this directive to all district commissioners to implement disability inclusive COVID-19 responses. We use Filipino sign language. When COVID-19 started, the media did not have sign language interpretation. We deaf persons broke information barriers. Now we have sign language interpretation for the news. We relay medical consultations and information with easy to understand infographics. We hope to partner with our government and experts for sustainable, accessible sign language communication systems. In the new reality, we must adapt to new normals. Every line matters. We are 618 million. We are fought. Leave us not behind. 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 Let us not behind. Leave us not behind. Leave us not behind. Leave us not behind. Thank you so much for for for, for that video and. You know, it, it, it really is, is a heartfelt one that, that goes goes to, to the core of the problem. No money, no food, no medicine, no soap. What if my parents die? And it's exactly this kind of struggle that, that we are no doubt seeing replicated across our region. Uh, and these are really some voices and messages that we have to keep in mind uh, as we proceed to explore the opportunities to protect and empower persons with disabilities. Uh, and that sets the scene very nicely for, for the next part of our webinar, which is our policy crucible that contains two components. The first is a panel conversation, and the second piece is a, a series of structured interventions that will dig deeper on the specific issues raised uh, by, uh, by the conversation today. The panel conversation focuses on the challenges and opportunities of developing disability inclusive responses in policy areas and the structured interventions will then showcase specific good practices in specific policy programs or practice areas, the application if you will. And then after the interventions by our panelists and discussants, uh, we will open the floor to all of you for questions and reflections. And uh, just to get you all ready, please type all inputs into the YouTube chat box, which is to the right of the YouTube video. And the SCAP team will be monitoring and collating the questions and reflections throughout uh, the webinar. We hope to get to all of the questions. If we don't, we will have uh, other ways of answering you as well. We will, we will tell you about it at the end of our session today. Now uh, it brings us to, to our panel and it really is my distinct pleasure to introduce a very distinguished series of panelists to you uh, and speaking in the following order. Madam Zhang Haidi, who is the chairperson of the China Disabled Persons Federation as well as the president of Rehabilitation International. She would be followed by Mr. Masahito Kawamori, who is the co-chair of the focus group on media accessibility of the International Telecommunications Union, followed by Mr. Stephen Sui, who is the senior expert and former Secretary of Labor and Welfare of the government of Hong Kong, China, followed by Ms. Anjali Agarwal, who is the executive director of Samathiam and member of the National Institution for Transforming India CSO Standing 
committee. And our last panelist is my dear colleague, Ms. Valerie Julian, who is the United Nations resident coordinator in Nepal. Uh, before I hand the floor to, to you, Madam Zhang, I'd like to just, just remind people about, uh, uh, about your, your background as well, as well as uh, being the chair of the China People's uh, China Disabled Persons uh, Federation since 2008. Uh, Madam Zhang has, uh, is also currently president of Rehabilitation International, which is an almost century old non-government organization. She's also executive president of Beijing Organizing Committee of the 2022 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games, member of the Standing Committee of the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Conser Consultative Conference, and winner of multiple uh, awards and renowned role model and author for me and for all of us that, that work on uh, disability inclusive uh, development. Madam Zhang, it's an absolute uh, pleasure to, to have you with us. And as a disability champion, we know you have worked tirelessly to mainstream disability inclusion into China's COVID-19 response by mobilizing resources uh, from all sectors, uh, from government and the community. Can you share with us a little bit this experience? China is a bit, a bit ahead of most of our countries on the COVID wave and your experience there, especially uh, the whole of nation approach to protecting and empowering persons with disabilities would be of great interest to all of us gathered here. Madam Zhang, over to you. Respected Mr. Kaviz Hidi, respected Ms. Maria uh, Soledad. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. It's my honor to attend this webinar organized by ESCAP. ESCAP played, uh, uh, have played a leading role in uh, promoting disability inclusive development in the, in the Asia Pacific region. As COVID-19 spreads, we are much concerned about our brothers and sisters with disabilities. We greatly appreciate ASCAP's special attention and the timely action at this difficult time. This webinar is of special significance, I think. Uh, as we were all uh, respected a uh, good year of 2020, COVID-19 outbreak hit the world. More than 4 million people, including over uh, 80,000 in China, have been infected. While the pandemic causes uh, disruptions in every aspect, people with disabilities have felt the strongest impact as they uh, face more difficulties and uh, inequality at this challenging time, I think. I care daily about them and wish they have a timely help. Soon after uh, the outbreak, uh, we learned a disabled child in Hubei was infected. We worried about it. We asked our local uh, Disabled Persons Federation to provide immediate help, uh, although it was very late at night. We worked with the governments to offer special care for persons with disabilities at the earliest uh, possible time, especially those with severe disabilities at nursing homes. We must take the best care for them and put them first. For example, in Zhuma Dian City, of Henan province. There are 2,000 people with disabilities living in more than 100 uh, care centers. And now, uh, and so far, of the, uh, none of them has been infected. I'm very glad to hear the good news. We have uh, assisted the government in meeting the uh, basic needs of persons with disabilities, providing care to adults and children in need. 
and ensuring uh, they have uh, adequate food, uh, drinking water, and uh, protection. We have uh, helped children study online, giving counseling and uh, advice on uh, home uh, based uh, rehabilitation, uh, offered psychology, psychological uh, health services, and provided uh, you know, vocational trainings so that they could be better uh, prepared to find jobs or start business after the pandemic. As president of RI International, I have worked with my colleagues to promote the protection of the rights and the interests of persons with disabilities during the uh, pandemic. On behalf of CDPF and RI, I have written to uh, ESCAP uh, uh, Executive Secretary Dr. Uh, Alish uh, uh, Zabana, as well as President of the UN General Assembly, Professor Bendy, UN Secretary uh, General Guterres, uh, WHO Director General Dr. Tedros, China of uh, a chair of the Bureau of the uh, Conference of the State uh, of State Paris, uh, parties to the CRPD, Mr. Uh, Galgos, and the uh, leaders of other international organizations uh, concerned, calling upon the, the international community to protect the rights and uh, interests of disabled people in the pandemic responses. President Bendy replied me that he would work with UN member states and take action to uh, control the virus and uh, mitigate its uh, impact on society and uh, uh, economy, especially on persons with disabilities. SG Guterres. Uh, also called on the governments to protect the rights and the interests of persons with disabilities and ensure their equal access to medical services and uh, assistance. I have also exchanged views with the leaders from other uh, international disability organizations. We mailed protective masks to friends overseas. RI has decided to, uh, to allocate 200,000 US dollars on joint projects uh, with ESCAP for the protection and the employ empowerment of uh, persons with disabilities in, in this region during and after the pandemic. Dear friends, I have uh, three proposal, uh, proposals here to make today. First, we should respect and uh, protect the disabled person's rights uh, to life and uh, health. I think every life is invaluable. Persons with disabilities uh, also have uh, a good aspirations. There should be no discrimination against them and their value. We must assure that persons with disabilities, the, the elderly women and the children in particular, have access to treatment and other services against the virus. We should meet their needs for basic living condition, uh, rehabilitation, education, and uh, employment. Second, we should protect persons with disabilities against the virus. To achieve this, we need to set up a long-term protective mechanism and uh, offer targeted guidance uh, based on their uh, specific needs. We need to build a network of uh, a cooperation among governments, society, uh, and the disability organizations so as to deliver effective protection, treatment, and recovery services. 
as well as to support their poverty relief and the employment after the uh, the pandemic. Third, we should enhance international cooperation. The pandemic does not mean suffering of any single country. It's a challenge to all the uh, to all humanity. We must work together to defeat it in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. We will coordinate policies, share experience, and learn from each other so as to better help the world's one billion persons with disabilities tied over the crisis. CDPF and uh, RI will continue to support and uh, echo the UN and SCAP's initiatives and uh, uh, actions in the dis disability related uh, field and uh, make our due contribution to disability inclusive though uh, through solidarity and cooperation we will surely defeat the virus and uh, achieve the goal of uh, leave no one behind thank you Thank you so much, uh, Madam Zhang. Uh, it, it's nice to hear, of course, the, the, the huge policy w uh, network that you are mobilizing to make sure that, that persons with disabilities are not left behind. But it's also heartening to hear the stories of individual people uh, th that you have reached out to. Uh, it, it really is a, uh, it's the perfect combination. And thank you so much for, for, for your intervention. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Masahito Kawamori, who is the Rapporteur of Accessibility to Multimedia Systems and Services at the International Telecommunications Union. He's also currently involved with standardization and promotion of accessibility related ICT with international bodies such as WHO clearly a vital, vital role in these times. His current projects include planning and building inclusive and resilient smart cities in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. And he's also professor at Keio University in Japan. So Kawamori-san, thank you so much for joining us. You are an expert on information and media accessibility. We saw in the video what a critical role media accessibility and information plays, especially during a can pandemic. So can you share with us some of the good practices, whether by governments or CSOs, in ensuring the accessibility of COVID-19 related public information at the national and local levels? Okay, oh, thank you. Okay, can I turn on my video? Is that okay? Perfect. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me thank you very much for your very uh, nice introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here among the distinguished panel. Yeah, uh, if I may, let me introduce um, ITU a little bit. International Telecommunication Union, ITU, is part of the United Nations as UN Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technology. It is the oldest international organization established in 1865. And ITU is unique as a United Nations agency because it is the only United Nations organization that has private sector members in it. So we have Netflix, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, and other big companies and small companies as part of our membership of ITU. As, um, as I explained at ITU, we've been working on information and communication standards for persons with disabilities, such as telephone relay service, which allows deaf person and hard of hearing people to communicate through telephone network with hearing people. 
this is the technology that's vital in the current situation where people cannot go directly to hospitals and clinics to, to get consultation. And we're also uh, standardizing accessible remote meetings for persons with disabilities to be able to participate fully in distant uh, conferences such as this one. And also we're working on audio navigation for visually impaired. And we also are discussing with um, autism organizations to how to help them uh, get access to information. And IT is also working closely with wor the World Health Organization, WHO, to provide vital information about COVID-19 worldwide. So during this COVID-19 pandemic, ICT has become essential. Without ICT, there will be no social distancing, obviously. And COVID-19 is the first pandemic in human history where technology and social media are being used on a massive scale to keep people safe, productive, and connected while being physically apart. So in this sense, ICT is an essential tool in providing vital health information to wider population. And this is especially true for persons with disabilities. And in this regard, ITU is especially working with persons with disabilities worldwide, especially in the Asian Pacific, such as the deaf community in the Philippines, just as you saw, just seen in the video presented before. However, as the new normal, what we call it, new normal progresses, it has become clear that new additional barriers are emerging, as pointed out by the concept note of SCAP that, uh, that um, I, I hope the, the audience is a bit uh, able to see. I think the current COVID-19 situation presents us new challenges for persons with disabilities, which I believe we should tackle and overcome with developing further technologies, especially in the area of information communication, such as artificial intelligence and augmented reality. Robotics may also be an important area. And also we can work on more inclusive digital healthcare, e-health and telemedicine. I also think that in the equation for successfully overcoming these new barriers, partnership with private sector will also be essential, especially for creating a sustainable ecosystem for inclusive society. We can invite more companies to take a more active role in making our world more accessible during and after this pandemic. So the partnership between persons with disabilities, governments, uh, NGOs, and also private sector, supported by technologies such as ICT, information communication technology, emerging technologies, as well as old technologies, will be the key for coping with this unprecedented pandemic that we're seeing right now as COVID-19. And in that regard, I, I would like to stress again that information communication technology is the key for not leaving anyone behind. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Kawamori-san. Uh, you know, you're speaking to a captive audience that is already, I think, converted in, in a way because we're all using technology like right now to keep in touch, to, to, to maintain ourselves in the work environment. Um, but it was interesting to hear what you said, that the, the new normal that we all find ourselves in has also sh uh, is also shining the light on, on, on a few barriers, new barriers that are emerging, especially for... Uh, for persons with, with disabilities. And this is where bringing in these multi-sectoral partnerships is going to be vital for overcoming uh, the barriers and making available things like e-health that you referred to. So thank you very much for your intervention and for the work of ITU. Thank you. Uh,
Thank you so much. Our next uh, speaker uh, is Mr. Stephen Asui, who has been the Commissioner for Rehabilitation and responsible for coordinating and mapping out policies and measures pertaining to the well-being uh, of persons with disabilities in Hong Kong, uh, as well as the Under Secretary and Secretary for Labour and Welfare uh, of the Hong Kong SAR government during uh, 20, 2008 to 2017. So exactly the right kind of person who was in the policy making role, really one of our target audiences for, for today's uh, conversation. So Mr. Sui, the pandemic has, has ravaged economies around the world and many persons with disabilities now simply find themselves in hardship. They are not unique, but they are, are in particular hardship. What types of social protection, what types of employment uh, uh, pr promotion measures are required in this time uh, in, for, in terms of the immediate response and the medium and long term response? And, and how can governments actually afford all of these measures? So, Mr. Sui, over to you. OK, thanks, Kavi. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, so it's timed to dig deep into our reserves in the midst of the COVID-19 epidemic to help businesses and individuals promptly, in particular the vulnerable to ride out this storm. So it's an unprecedented crisis. We need immediate and timely action, but at the same time should not lose sight that it is also an opportunity to invest into our social protection and employment support systems for long-term development and strengthen our capacity to respond effectively at times of crisis. So given the pandemic's catastrophic impact on the economy worldwide, the government has to dig deep into its physical reserves to help our businesses and people, especially person disabilities, most of them are financially insecure and more vulnerable in employment. So in designing the policies and measures, mainstream disability is necessary to ensure that persons with disabilities will equally enjoy and not be discriminated against in any support and protection throughout. So in tandem, targeted measures and reasonable accommodations should also be in place to facilitate the more vulnerable persons with disabilities to enjoy equal rights with others. So in the face of this unprecedented challenge, economic activities worldwide has been severely disrupted. Some come to a complete halt. So many businesses face pleasure of closing down. So massive staff laid-offs are anticipated, causing hardship to families and individuals. So immediate measures along the three strategic directions, namely helping business to stay afloat, retaining workers in employment, and relieving financial burdens of individuals and businesses are required. So these measures should be easy to access, quick to disperse funds, and sufficiently board based while providing extra relief to hard hit sectors and individuals. <clears throat> So while we need to help those unemployed, the urgent task is to stop the bleeding. So hence foremost is the component of job retention, job creation and job advancement. So taking Hong Kong as they are, and as an example, the Hong Kong as they are government has introduced an employment support scheme. So whereby the government provides wage subsidy amounting 50% of wages subject to a wage cap in a period of six months to employers to retain the employers in return for employers undertaking not to implement redundancies. So people on self-employment, including freelance workers and those in the so-called slash economy will also be assisted through a one-off lump sum subsidy. So in tandem, 30,000 time limited jobs in public and private sectors will be created in the coming two years. The government as the biggest employer will recruit for over 10,000 civil service jobs and 5,000 interns for young people and deployed additional resources to support job advancement projects in the private sector to facilitate employees in the private sector 
to learn new skills, to strengthen their work capacity and adaptability to changing work environment. So saving businesses hard hit by the pandemic is conducive to saving jobs. So in this regard, the government will also provide subsidies and loans, grant rental concessions and fee waivers, and divert tax and loan repayments to reduce the financial burdens. So on social protection, there is in place a standing scheme in Hong Kong, namely the means tested Comprehensive Social Assistance Assist, uh, Social Security Assistance, the CSS8, which is a safety net for any family not having sufficient means and the unemployed. So the access limit of the scheme will be relaxed for six months to allow more families with people unemployed become eligible. So to help relieve financial burdens of individuals, there will also be deferral of salaries tax payments, concessions, raise and charges, reduction of public transport fares, etc. And complementing the above general relief measures, targeted measures to help the poor and the vulnerable, in particular person disabilities, are also put in place. These include additional payment of a disability allowances and other assistance under the safety net. Uh, these are on top of the established measures to help those with employment difficulties, including person disabilities and women with low skills. These standing targeted measures include unemployment support, a job matching for employers and job seekers with disabilities and related consultant and support services. And a job child and on the job training for job seekers with disabilities together with a nine month allowance for employers as an incentive and continuous counseling service for employees with disabilities, the employers and peers, and a cash award to those who serve as their mentors to facilitate employees with disabilities to settle in. On the side of social protection, under the CSSA, there is a higher monthly payment and a special subsidies to cover medical and other additional expenses arising from disabilities and also a monthly non minced tested disability allowance to person disabilities and a monthly special allowance to persons with severe disabilities to hire clearers while sustaining employment. So for countries who have yet to put in place such measures, it is opportune time for them to face in this initiatives in this difficult time. So and turn them into a standing practice as long term social protection and employment support measures so as to become resilient in safeguarding the well being of people, in particular person disabilities and underprivileged in face of another crisis in future. So in fact, many experts believe that COVID-19 will still be with us and become the new normal. So it is imperative that social protection system, including redundancy compensation, that is severance payment or long service payment and CSSA in the context of Hong Kong, employment support policies and legislation against disability discrimination and unreasonable dismissal are established and continuously enhanced along social and economic developments. So in the process, we need to be to act in concert. So while the government has the undeniable obligation to take the lead, the government has to involve the entire community, including employees, employers, civil societies, organizations, persons with disabilities, trust funds, NGOs, etc., to form strong partnership to fight the virus and plumb up the economic thunderstorm. Thank you. Stephen, thank you, thank you so much for that, and and, and that was such a rich uh, intervention, full of of the kinds of details that many many countries and 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 governments, uh, national and local, are, are now looking for how to support. Uh, so, so we will definitely be coming back to you to get more of of your notes. But but I did particularly like uh, the 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 way that you you've captured it. Many of the measures that are now being put in place in this urgent situation 
are actually ones that should become standard practice because they are part of investing in people. They are part of the broader social protection that we need to bring in place. And I think you even gave everybody a motto for, for, for the way they should act uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the, the support being provided to businesses, to persons with disability, to their employers. Uh, you, you said e easy to access, quick to disperse. And I think with that, you capture exactly uh, what is needed. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for your intervention. If we could now move to our next uh, panelist, uh, who is Anjali uh, Agawa. Uh, Anjali is, is an award-winning uh, disability advocate, author, researcher, and social entrepreneur. She is co-founder of uh, Samathiyam, an organization of persons with disabilities founded in 1993. She's also a member of the National Institution for Transforming India, the CSO Standing Committee. She recently founded the COVID-19 Action Collaborative, so the perfect person to speak with us. She was team lead and chief access auditor of Accessible India campaign. Anjali was awarded the Role Model National Award presented by the President of India in 2003, as well as the Best Innovative Policy Award by the United Nations in 2016. Um, Ms. Agarwal, you are an active member of the Indian government's CSO committee. So could you share your perspective on how CSOs, in particular organizations of persons with, with disabilities, are playing a role uh, of partners in both policy design and service delivery, especially at such a critical time? Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zaidi. I'm honored to be with the distinguished panel. Few countries have some universal disaster management protocols addressing the concerns of the world's largest minority. In India, there are approximately 150 million people with disabilities. When the COVID-19 lockdown one was announced on 21st March, 2020, we were not prepared to deal with the crisis. Question was service delivery and access to caregivers. We prepared to deal with the crisis, but we needed local support systems, resolution methodologies, and graded response based on the disability restrictions and dependency. I'm sharing with our uh, Samarthyam's organization's successful example of COVID-19 action collaborative of government and civil society organizations, including organizations of persons with disability. A multi-sectoral collaboration and policy partnership was planned for pan-India connectivity with people with disabilities. This is to reassure that their survival is a priority and is a huge anxiety among people with disabilities towards recovery and also life after COVID-19. We started working with Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, Government of India. In close partnership, we had some strategic interventions and quick wins, which I'm going to share now. Creating a WhatsApp group of high-level government officers with support from the department, secretaries, chief and state commissioners for persons with disabilities to ensure outreach in rural and remote areas as well. The group shared government orders, details of local nodal officers, procurement and dissemination of daily need items, e-passes for caregivers, etc. It is an excellent networking platform and huge support to local authorities to learn and get local media news to connect effectively. After the lockdown, an immediate action was to get a comprehensive disability inclusive guideline for protection and safety of persons with disabilities in light of COVID-19. This was issued by the Secretary, Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities to all the states. Also, notification was sent to state health authorities to provide accessible facilities for people with disabilities in quarantine centers and health facilities. State commissioners for persons with disabilities did not have 
official Twitter handle, and they were encouraged to create and maintain one. Many Twitter handles were created. Hence, social media connectivity and linkages increased multifold. State officers have started tackling grassroots issues and networking with organizations of persons with disabilities to ensure leave no one behind. COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown measures imposed forced exclusion, rising inequalities and distress, impacting girls and women with disabilities. Majority of them were otherwise faced, facing a lockdown situation and now being confined to their homes, they experienced ex increased domestic violence. They were unable to reach out to the volunteers of organizations of persons with disabilities in times of distress. The partnership helped in leveraging connectivity, and I want to share a case study here. A leader of organization of persons with disability residing in a semi-urban area was unable to buy ration and sell protection materials, including girl gloves, masks, and sanitizers due to unstable financial situation in the family. The government and organization local area support system, that is a WhatsApp group, helped her to get food packets and commodities delivered at home. She is now being respected in her family. The COVID-19 crisis is new. Our government CSO partnership has provided many tangible solutions, including integrating gender perspectives into the disability inclusive responses. Dear friends, I have some policy recommendations to make. In current situation, uh, so I was talking about the policy recommendations exactly. which I wanted to make. Uh, first, in current situation, enhance prevention, preparedness, and readiness to ensure a robust response of connectivity with poorest of the poor persons with disabilities. Second, strategize local plans to address unique issues post-pandemic. Local support system integrated with access to essential service delivery, personal medical emergencies, food and financial resources. It is vital that the civil society organizations, government and local councils work with markets to recognize and prioritize women with disabilities access to food and medicine services. Local governments in association with organizations of persons with disabilities to create awareness through virtual platforms to break stereotype gender roles. This will support women and girls with disabilities in a big way. Government, civil society organization, and organization of persons with disabilities partnership can foster strengthening preparedness for eventual recovery, future emergencies, and implement gender, age, and disability inclusive exit strategies. I want to end by quoting Professor Stephen Hawking, the past like the future is indefinite and exists only as a spectrum of possibilities. It is time that we include people with disabilities as co-creators of COVID-19 inclusive responses as champions, problem solvers, and not as victims. Hence, all of us must collectively act, interact, and communicate to get quality of opportunities, ensuring we leave no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for for your intervention and 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 for, for, for reminding us at the very end that that whatever solutions uh, uh, we find, persons with disabilities have to be at the heart of those solutions in defining those very solutions, whether they're technological solutions or solutions in terms of accessing the food and medicine that that you mentioned. And I was heartened to see that something as simple as a WhatsApp group can have such a big effect in such a large and important uh, country. So thank you for bringing some of those those stories to, to life uh, for us. Thank you. Um, thank you again. Uh, so we now move on to our, our final uh, uh, panelist, who is my colleague, uh, Valerie Julian, who is the United Nations <laughs> resident coordinator for Nepal. She's been the resident coordinator in Nepal since 2016. And before that, has also served as resident coordinator in other countries, including Guatemala and the Dominican uh, Republic. She worked for 14 years with the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA. So she, she knows intimately what it's like to be responding to crisis. 
And prior to joining the UN system, she was uh, working at Handicap International as program director for Serbia and Bosnia. So I think we actually have found the perfect person for, for the panel from within our, 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 our UN leaders. Um, Valerie, because of your, your leadership, uh, Nepal has been chosen as a, a pilot to implement the United Nations Disability Inclusion Strategy. Um, could you share a little bit your views and examples of how the UN and the UN country teams can better partner with, with governments, with stakeholders to develop uh, disability inclusive responses, especially in crisis times like we find ourselves in right now. So welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Can you see very me? Well. Very well. OK, so that's perfect. So thank you very much first for organizing this forum. I think it's very important that we give the attention uh, to the people with disability. This is definitely a topic that doesn't get uh, enough attention despite all the efforts that, uh, that we all do. And in order to respond to your question, uh, Kavi, maybe I'm thinking of using the example of Nepal, since I'm DRC in Nepal, so I would like to use this example. And first to say that in Nepal, of course, the people with disability face here the same problem as anywhere else in the world. But in addition, it is an invisible population because the census of 2011 uh, did not give an opportunity for the people with disability to be well counted. So therefore, they are invisible. We don't see them. They represent, as per the census, less than 2% of the population. And all the census that we have done after that, all the studies demonstrate that it's, the figure is certainly closer to 15% instead of 2%. And of course, they, are, they have low literacy rates, very high unemployment, and among them, the women are definitely the most affected. So this being said, it's nothing new because I'm say I know it's happening in many other countries. So the good practices that we have in Nepal, actually, I would like to summarize them around those points. First, we have a strong partnership with the National Federation of People with Disability. And I insist on the National Federation, because while we have international agencies or NGOs working with that, it is important that we go with the national one. Because, for instance, in the context of Nepal, in addition to the discrimination that can exist against people with disability, you have to adopt all the other forms of discrimination that come and accumulates, like, for instance, the caste discrimination, ethnic discrimination. And that makes the situation for the disabled people even more difficult. Also, I have to say that when it comes to the crisis, because it was your question, Kavi, is that all these partnerships were established before the crisis. So when the crisis occurred, we were ready. We had uh, this link with the organization. Then the other partnership that is essential to uh, establish, it's with the government. And in the case of Nepal, it's a federal country. So we have established this partnership at federal, provincial, and local level. So that we are sure that when we discuss uh, our intervention and what we can do, we work with all the layers uh, of the government. Another thing we have done here in Nepal is that we have established a task force on people with disability, on disability. Mostly because if we just talk about it without having a real mechanism and endeavor to carry it through, then it remains a rhetoric. So having a task force means that we have a group of agencies that are de dedicated to looking at this issue on a regular basis. Secondly, we always have a twin approach to the issue of disability. That is, on the one hand, the mainstreaming, but at the same time, a targeted approach. Mainstreaming is essential to change the mentality, to slowly impact on policy. But the targeted approach um, gives you the possibility to really go and affect, in a positive manner, the life of people. We should not stay at the level of mainstreaming only because sometimes it can resemble, you know, sp sprinkling a bit of sugar on a cake. Now, what we want is the cake to be really sweet. So we want to have the targeted approach as well. Another thing that is really important is the joint programs. So I was taking, talking about task force. I was talking about all this joint approach, but it has to tr translate into a joint program where we really work together towards one or, or several objectives that have been defined. I also mentioned it earlier on, but I want to come back on the multiple forms of discrimination. Because we know that people with disability are discriminated, but they are not only discriminated because they have, they have a, a disability. Take the case, as I say, for instance, in Nepal, of a woman, Dalit, which is the uh, caste that is the least respected in Nepal, 
then with disability and uh, let's say she's poor <laughs> in addition to that because property is also a big source of discrimination so these multiple form of discrimination have to be addressed as they are that is to say we have to take into consideration each aspect of the discrimination and address it individually then um data i know that many of the speakers before me have mentioned this issue of data and i said it at the onset in nepal people with disability are invisible they are not counted and if you are not counted you don't count so that's very important and here we are working on the next census for 2021 making sure that the washington sets of questions are in although i'm not sure we'll succeed but we are working on that we have done some rapid needs assessment of the needs of the people with disability so that we are not talking in general. We have their responses. And of course, they are included in the social economic impact assessment that we are going to do for COVID. And also here in Nepal, we walk the talk. We had the UN House completely assessed by people with disability organization to tell us what we needed to change to make sure that the UN House was disabled friendly. And we have invested the money to equip the house, we have elevators, we have all the necessary sign, everything was as per the advice of the people with disabilities organization. Then of course we are training our staff and we are addressing these issues with our staff so that they know exactly what it means, what they have to do, how they can incorporate this in their program. And we have of course disability approach to human rights, to procurement, to all uh, the different aspects. Now I would like to give you some specific example of the response uh, to COVID uh, where the disability has been uh, included. First of all, it's a standing agenda in the UNCT. So it's once again, it's not something we talk about uh, on occasion. No, it's a standing, at, uh, standing at item in our agenda. Secondly, we did a rapid needs assessment and we didn't do it directly. Handicap International has organized this assessment and now we are using the results in our own programming and assessment. Secondly, we have mainstreamed the issue of disability throughout the country preparedness and response plan that each country has been elaborating to respond to COVID. So once again, it was not an afterthought. It was from the beginning. As you know, with COVID, we have to quarantine people. So we have evaluated all the quarantine sites. And one of the elements of evaluation was, was it disable friendly? And since we saw it was not, we immediately engaged in an advocacy approach with the government and telling them, please, can we agree that people with disability do not go to quarantine sites, but home quarantine? Because since the sites were not good for them, let's make sure they go to their home. And the government has agreed with that. Then, of course, we have, we have uh, put together a services of psychosocial uh, support, and we have trained counselors to the special needs of people with disability. And we are also extending the psychosocial support to the caregivers of people with disability so that we have done that really once again, integrating the disability from day one. We are using the people with disability as our key informant in all the assessment we have been doing. And also in our own response plan, we have had a differential approach to relief, for instance, we need to have special packages of relief when it comes to hygiene, for instance, for people with disability. This is not the regular hygiene uh, kit. So all this has been included. And when it comes to communication, we have been really putting a big emphasis. First of all, all the daily press briefings that are done by the Ministry of Health now are also with sign language. So it was important. Secondly, there is a video on self-care for people with disability that we have put together. Another example, it's a ra radio jingle on mental health that we have, that we are playing around and around and around the country to make sure that people with disability gets it. Then we have a rehabilitation video uh, series for home care intervention that is also with a focus on people with disability. Then, of course, sign language has been incorporated in all our communication, and we also have an infographic. And finally, we have developed some specific guidelines for the continuation of essential services, rehabilitation services for people with disability, as well as some guidelines on disability inclusive COVID-19 healthcare services. So all these two guidelines are really helpful for us, but also for our partners, the NGOs. 
So finally, where to go from there? It was also an aspect and maybe the big lessons that I wanted to extract from those examples, which I hope have helped in um, explaining how we can include and uh, incorporate all these dimensions. First, we have to remember that as UN, what we do has an impact. Even if sometimes we may think that we are not so important, which we are not indeed, because <laughs> we are not the only players. But the UN is important in countries. And if we do, if we have the right approach on disabled, on disability, it will influence the government, civil society, private sector. So what the UN does has an impact, is heard. We set a trend. And that's why it's important that we have to put our acts together. We cannot stay at the level of the rhetoric. Secondly, data, data, data. As I say, what is not accounted does not count. So we really need as UN to continue to invest on collecting data, on helping government to have the proper data. Of course, the multiple agency focus is important. The issue of disability does not pertain to one agency only. It's a little bit like the issue of gender. You know, some decades ago, we were saying, oh, gender, it's only one agency. No, now we know that gender has to be taken on by all the agencies. The same for disability. We have to achieve with disability what we have achieved with gender. But it comes with the political will of all of us to push it forward systematically and consistently. Third, uh, third or fourth, I don't know now, give the voice to the people with disability. One thing that we say constantly, people with disability have some abilities. So let them speak for themselves. They know what they need. They are not helpless people. And we have to give them voice. And you see, as UN, that's our main responsibility, to speak for those sometimes who have no voice. Because if they cannot talk, then we need to talk for them. And that's why we have privileges and immunities. Because what we say has no impact on us. We are protected. And sometimes we know that local people cannot speak up so easily because they may risk retaliation or problems. So we have to give voice to the people with disability and we have to be their voice when they don't have one. And two last points, we need to harness their skills. As I say, people with disability have abilities. They have different abilities. They, they may not have certain abilities, but they have many others. So we have to harness their skills. And this translates into my last point. We need to recruit people with disability. Because the same, we talk and talk and talk. How many people with disability work in the UN? How many people with disability work in government? How many people with disability work in other, in the private sector? For instance, in my country, companies are obliged to recruit people with disability, a certain percentage. And if they don't, they pay a fine. Guess what? Most of the companies rather pay the fine than recruit people with disability. So we have to change all that and to be forceful in the fact that if we want to include people with disability, we have to include them everywhere, including in our own organizations. I will stop here, Kelly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I won't summarize because you did it perfectly uh, yourself. Uh, I think you, you, you've captured it. But what stays with me is, is, is we have to lead by example, exactly as you are doing uh, in, in, in Nepal. And, and, and I took very much to heart the, the, the importance of working with the national institutions, the national setup that is already in place. Because as many speakers have said, yes, this is a crisis, but many of the things that we're doing now were needed anyway and will be needed even uh, once hopefully we get over this, this crisis. And, and we are going to be watching very carefully to see uh, how, how you do and how, how well you fare with the implementation of the UN uh, disability inclusion strategy so we can learn from that and share with the rest of the region uh, and especially when it comes to the data the making the invisible visible this is at the heart of the Incheon strategy this is something that governments have I would say committed to and so making that link would, would enable us to hold them to that high bar that is expected so thank you so much for for joining us uh, Valerie Colleagues and, and friends, we're now moving to the next segment of, of, our, of our conversation where, where, where people, uh, real experts uh, from governments, experts, institutions, CSOs, uh, UN, uh, are going to have the near impossible task of, of speaking on their issues for two to three minutes only. Uh, but I think that we're already going to get a lot of richness 
out of it because in, even in those two or three minutes, we're going to get a glimpse of the situation across the board, whether it's within the governments and the government perspective, the CSO perspective, the UN uh, perspective. And to kickstart us, we, we have an extremely distinguished uh, 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 participant, Ms. Uh, Afa, Afa Masaga Fauga Mulitalo, who is the Chief Executive Officer, Ministry of Women, Community and Social Development of Samoa. Uh, so so we, we really look forward to hearing the perspective and the voice of the Pacific. Uh, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, once again, greetings from Samoa. It's lovely to um, uh, see you. Unfortunately, we can't see everyone uh, from my end. But given the very short um, time allocated for this um, uh, exercise, I'll just quickly take you through. Uh, I understand and I think that everyone has got um, uh, own best practices uh, and systems and mechanisms in place um, to uh, uh, engage our people with disabilities and um, also uh, look at ways to address uh, the needs of our people with disabilities. And um, relating to COVID-19 and our efforts to ensure that we include and engage our people with disabilities in the programs and the interventions we've been uh, undertaking, not only to prepare uh, our communities and our people um, uh, for COVID-19, but also to respond in the event that COVID-19 actually um, reaches our shores. We have embarked on our media campaign, a mass media campaign, and we engaged the director of the Umbrella Organization for Disability Organizations in Samoa um, in one of our panel um, uh, mem uh, discussions on the television. Uh, mainly the program um, is to prepare our, 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 our communities. Right from the clinical um, side of things, we also have our associate minister, who is also a doctor, um, to, to talk specifically on um, what to uh, do uh, in order to prepare for uh, home isolation, for example, maintaining cleanliness and hygiene in the homes and in the, uh, the neighborhood. Uh, uh, so we engage our people with disabilities through that um, mechanism and we also put up um, our television advertisements uh, and also utilizing our interpreters uh, to uh, make sure uh, they deliver our, our, our deaf uh, population groups understand the messages through the sign language and um, we have also uh, uh, been working together with uh, our uh, our disability partners and we've also uh, distributed um, food plants, crops uh, for families with people with disabilities. The whole idea is not only to focus uh, at the current situation but looking ahead and looking beyond of COVID-19 to ensure that there's always food and we have sufficient food supplies to rely on. So even in the absence of boats or, or in the sh uh, shortage of food supplies from overseas, but we don't um, uh, panic knowing that we have enough food supplies around our homes and our communities. We are planning our outreach program uh, from next week, Wednesday, and we are also targeting people with disabilities. This is mainly to reinforce the messages that was conveyed over TV and radio and also having uh, an opportunity to interact with the people and actually demonstrate what's been talked about over our media um, campaign programs. So um, the whole idea of uh, preparing our communities uh, includes our people with disabilities. And so that's that's the work that we've been doing because of the nature of COVID-19 and uh, the fact that there's no uh, protection for people. We decided from the beginning of the of the state of emergency that we will do our, our campaigns via uh, the media outlets until the time is right. And now it's uh, more is still COVID free, uh, and we and um, we have uh, received declaration from uh, the Director General of Health last week that we are still COVID free. So that's why we've decided to implement our our outreach program 
uh, beginning from next week. But people with disabilities will certainly be uh, included in our program in the communities. So that's basically what we've, we've been doing. And um, we are planning to uh, um, go out, as I said briefly, and to make sure that we include our people with disabilities in the program. Thank you. I hope I haven't gone over time. Thank you so much. As I said, it's an impossible task and, and, and we are going to come back to you and, and try to collect some of these examples because some of the th things that are now happening, the greater emphasis being given to organizations for persons with disability, for example, these should also be part of the new normal. The new normal should also include the increase in investments uh, uh, to make the lives of persons with disabilities uh, uh, easier in terms of their full participation. Uh, so thank you for sharing sharing that with us. Uh, next we have Mr. Victor Pineda, who's the president of World Enabled and co-chair of Cities for All Global Platform and founding member of the G20 Smart Cities Alliance. Mr. Victor, o over to you. Thank you very much. Do you see me? Yeah, uh, yes, we see you. Yeah, we can hear you very well and we see a future cities press release. Okay, so this is uh, something that I want to share. Let me give you a bit of background before we uh, talk about some of the new announcements. Uh, my, my story is that I am a uh, urban planner, professor and director of the Inclusive Cities uh, Lab. But also, like many colleagues on this call, helped to draft, implement, and really think about how to advance the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And it's a great honor to work with a special envoy to do just that in a partnership of cities. Well, I believe that the cities are the future not only the future for addressing challenges, but addressing the opportunities. And the opportunities that we have right now is to think about leveraging innovation at the local level, technology and leveraging ways of creating more inclusive and resilient systems as a result of the COVID pandemic. What I'd like to say is that the challenges of this new society are really the challenges of the city and a majority of the world's population. Over 56% lives in cities, and this proportion only continues to rise. The COVID pandemic brings into sharp focus the challenges and contradictions that the human systems that we've created have um, placed upon the lived experience of people with disabilities. Cities are what we're witnessing everything in the most exaggerated manner. It's also where conflicts, but where solidarity can emerge. Whether we're talking about the future of work or the future of the social contract, everything will change, I believe, as a result of this pandemic. And all the big issues that we've been looking at from the Sustainable Development Goals will need to be catalyzed and will need to be brought together into sharper focus. I brought up the, this press release as a sneak peek to you all to join us on Wednesday of next week where we conclude nine weeks of discussions with experts from around the world, really reimagining what a city can be in this new normal post-COVID for persons with disabilities. And there's two clear things that emerge from the nine weeks of webinars, is that city leaders and experts in disability advocacy organizations have clearly stated as has Valerie, as has the Special Envoy, as have other speakers stated here today, 
that a lot of cities do not know what to do to ensure that people with disabilities um, had clear mechanisms and ways of protecting and empowering their rights. And they needed guidance, city leaders needed guidance. And we've collected some of those learnings. The second challenge was data. Not being able to understand the breadth and the depth of the challenge creates opportunities for really understanding what is needed. So as a result of those two um, challenges, we've decided to launch on the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, the Global um, Survey on Inclusive Pandemic Response to really collect comparative data on to what local governments have been doing and to launch declared actions for empowering local governments on inclusive pandemic response. This is in line with our partnership with UN Habitat, with the World Bank, with the United States and local governments, and with the Office of the UN Special Envoy on Disability. And I think what we should all take into consideration is that we aren't going to be able to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. We're not going to be able to really create an inclusive future if we don't focus on the localization and the local capabilities. So we need more training, we need more capacity, and we need more uh, multi-sector collaboration at the local level. And the discussions happening globally have to have a local lens. You can join us on the global campaign called Cities for All. And you can join us in ensuring that cities have an inclusive COVID response. I leave my email in the chat box, but the website is citiesforall.org. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Victor. And we would be happy to to also share uh, the the details, the video, but also the case studies that that you've you've already put together. As you say, many are scrabbling, looking for the same solutions. So we will definitely share that with the with the audience. Can, Thank can you very me, much. Let me just mention yes. one important topic. We 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 we're very very short on time. So is is it possible to to, to skip that? Go ahead. Uh, I just think that we all need to find a way to create a knowledge hub yeah. and a knowledge map so that we can share the resources. Thank you. So we have, uh, we will come to that at the end. We have a mini knowledge hub. I won't say it's the definitive global one, but but uh, I hope it will help. And, and again, thank you. And next we have Ms. Lee Sin Yi, who is the president of the Singapore Physiotherapy Association. Uh, Ms. Lee, over to you. Hi. Um... Yeah, I would um, like to really uh, thank everyone for, for this session and I really echo the, 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 the um, panelists um, speaking on the importance of multi-sectoral partnerships and I hope my sharing today uh, will be able to um, provide um, some insights as to the um, critical need to ensure continual accessibility for rehabilitation for persons with disabilities as well, whether it's during or beyond the COVID period. So from the Singapore experience, as for many other countries, um, during this COVID period, there has been a major shift towards the suspension of rehabilitation service beyond acute hospitals. Um, this has happened in Singapore as well. Okay, all face-to-face -face outpatient and community-based rehab services okay, have um, been actually suspended during our circuit breaker measures. Okay, and um, um, they were all subjected to review by government authorities at a patient-level exemption. And as a result, okay, this has impacted community-based rehabilitation and also inevitably restricted services okay, um, for persons with disabilities. So even in Singapore, actually, um, 
the teleconsultation was encouraged as a new mode of rehabilitation and rehabilitation could only continue during circuit breaker periods if it was carried out through teleconsultations. Yet it's a new mode for both practitioners as well as clientele. Okay, there were a lot of challenges in terms of the adopting, uh, adapting the technology, in terms of um, accessibility of technology amongst um, certain population groups. Okay, and um, we all know that for rehabilitation, a lot of our interventions uh, require and assessments require hands-on. And hence, um, telehealth uh, is new and um, is challenging to, well, when this entire situation came about as well. And as an association, uh, we recognize this need okay, for circuit breaker measures and yet um, this importance to actually protect and to be the voice okay, to, um, of um, vulnerable patient groups. And what we did um, prior um, to the circuit breaker measures was really to uh, compile um, an evidence-based uh, list of, of, post, of the reasons of why certain population groups require essential rehabilitation services. And we gathered this from our professional group and presented this over to our Ministry of Health. And we hope that these um, can um, advocate okay, for um, vulnerable patient groups to the ministry that rehabilitation is essential during this period, whether is it for COVID or non-COVID patients. Gradually, as we open up um, the rehabilitation services in the community. Currently, Singapore is in the progress um, in the progress of doing this in a stage-wise manner. There is a need to protect and reduce a local transmission risk um, to the patient groups as well. And hence, the association is working very closely with the Ministry of Health to provide um, training, to coordinate the training of personal protective equipment and to also coordinate the pro procurement of such PPE for um, home-based therapists uh, providing respiratory care. And these are particular patient groups that physiotherapists see that are urgent and also at very high risk of also um, um, getting the condition. At the same time, we have also worked okay, to put together practice guidelines for rehabilitation practitioners in terms of infection control and safe distancing, we have put together um, some of the materials from the government into um, guidelines um, specific so that they can apply to their respective settings. In terms of tele-rehab, we have actually published um, our guidelines with the help of other physiotherapy associations and actually working with also the World Confederation for Physical Therapy to explore ways to share knowledge and skill sets in the region. And yet in the long run, it will be important for us to actually collaborate with other agencies to see how we can actually better build the technology infrastructure as well as these resources that will be critical for lower income countries where telehealth approaches could still be limited as well for rehab. So that's um, just my bit of sharing from the rehabilitation perspective from Singapore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. A, a, a very interesting uh, perspective and, and, and I think it, it reinforces the need for us to begin to bring together so many of these uh, guidelines etc that have been put together that could 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 have use way beyond say in this case the Singapore context and, and we will definitely try to do so. Thank you so much. We will now move on to our next, uh, uh, the next person, Ms. Uh, Ng Lai Tin, who is the project officer at the National Early Childhood Intervention Council of Malaysia. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaveh. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to just echo what um, Mr. Carl Mori um, stated just now, that ICT is crucial during COVID-19 to ensure that um, persons with disabilities stay safe, productive, productive and connected, um, which is uh, because during the COVID-19 pandemic, many local practitioners in Malaysia quickly switched to telehealth services to ensure that children with disabilities have continuous learning and intervention services. So at National Early Childhood Intervention Council, we collaborated with um, UNICEF Malaysia to provide funding so that um, families and children continue to get targeted telehealth services. Um, and this will largely uh, reduce the financial burden on the families with disabilities to gain access to intervention services. And in the short time that we've um, started this project, I'd like to highlight four lessons uh, we've learned so far in terms of conducting telehealth services from the practitioner's perspective. 
Um, firstly, it is very important that the interventions are tailored to address the immediate needs of the ch child with disabilities and her family. For example, um, practitioners, instead of providing um, the usual intervention goals, they need to help the family to work out a suitable home routine and as well as ways to maintain a calm home environment, especially for children with um, autism. And secondly, instead of uh, providing direct instruction to children, practitioners need to shift to a model that focuses on parent coaching. Thirdly, we must consider using various telecommunication methods because not every family with disabilities have access to internet, computer and smartphones. And lastly, um, I'd like to also echo what um, Miss Valerie mentioned just now, the importance of psychosocial support for um, people with disabilities. Um, same for practitioners who provide telehealth services, they need to be prepared to provide psychological first aid support to both children with disabilities as well as their parents and caregivers during this time as it has been overwhelming and stressful. Um, moving forward, um, NECIC also provided a guideline that is based on the Early Childhood Intervention Centre's context to prepare them for the reopening of operations um, for physical face-to-face -face intervention services. And that's all from um, my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And some, thank you for re-emphasizing some of what we've already heard. I mean, even we saw even in, in the in the earlier video that we showed that, that, that the, uh, the, the psychological impacts of this uh, are being felt, uh, including uh, with, with persons with disabilities. And, and how, how do we indeed respond to these? And it's not always a question of technology. So thank you for reminding us of that. Um, our next speaker, Mr. Nazmul Bari, who's the Director, Center for Disability in Development of Bangladesh. Over to you, sir. We can't hear Mr. Nazmul yet. Okay. Maybe we come back to Mr. Nazmul Bari, who is uh, in Bangladesh. Hello. Ah, Hello. yes, we can hear ah. now. Yes. I'm sorry. I think uh, there were some uh, technological uh, challenges. Uh. Go so, ahead. Thank we you. See you. Uh, okay. So thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to start with uh, raising a question to any one of the panelists. It's about uh, disability disaggregated data, like. Are we having uh, access to this information, like uh, how many persons with disabilities are accessing their testing facilities, or being tested, or being affected, or being reached in this response as far as the disability, different disability groups? And uh, if yes, is it something already in a built-in mechanism, or is it something ad hoc? Now, next I'd like to share some of the uh, good practices that we have uh, done. Uh, the Center for Disability in Development, you know, we have been already working on uh, disability inclusion in the country, whereby we have been working with uh, organizations of persons with disability, self-help groups, supporting in uh, leadership of, uh, of different groups of persons with disabilities, uh, women with disabilities, advocacy, and their linkages with the local government institutes. So there was already some sort of uh, connectivity you know, even before the COVID-19 struck. So once the COVID-19 pandemic has struck our country, what we have seen in some of these areas, the organizations of persons with disabilities and their social groups then quickly mobilized and started with the risk information, uh, making sure that persons with disabilities are risk, they have access to the information, you know, what are the preventive uh, measures, where they can, should go if uh, such a situation arises, at the same time, informing the state parties, the responders of the different challenges and the different issues that they must be considering when they are thinking about these uh, uh, response. So this was already being done and all, they were also reaching the families. And once the different uh, uh, state level initiatives started on uh, uh, COVID-19 responses, like uh, policies, 
uh, humanitarian assistance guidelines, which we were talking about forming committees who would do the listing and uh, including uh, different people. Having that connectivity and the recognition at the community level of these groups of persons with disabilities in some of these areas, what we have seen and experienced that both of them have come together, the organizations of persons with disabilities groups, as well as the local government initiatives, where persons with disabilities have become members of these uh, different committees, such influencing the decision-making process and the selection. And uh, they have also represented the voices of uh, different groups of uh, persons with uh, uh, disabilities. And since they had a list of persons with disabilities uh, disaggregated by uh, you know, age, uh, gender, and the different uh, disability, so all of these groups were being able to be connected uh, with the local government initiatives and the state government initiatives on uh, the COVID-19 humanitarian response. And uh, so the, uh, the risk of awareness was being uh, addressed, which could be done. The database plays a huge uh, contributory role and uh, they could connect with the, the local government, you know, and uh, link with the different agencies that they had. That was also important. And, uh, you know, so all of this, what we have seen has uh, uh, linked up very nicely with the national level you know, policy advocacy that was being done at the, uh, uh, by CTD, other disability specific organizations, umbrella organizations of persons with disabilities. So that the things that were being said there and those are being uh, supported and practiced at the, at the community level with the uh, support of uh, organizations of uh, persons with uh, uh, disabilities. Now, what I would like to end by uh, saying is that, you know, we do have many challenges. There's no doubt about that. It's not all positive everywhere, but there are, so, there are also good practices and successes. Let us really learn from those and strengthen the enabling factors, and let us be better prepared you know, for uh, anything like that in the future, and let us really uh, be inclusive, truly inclusive, and have a uh, you know, build back better in the future. So thank you uh, very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much. And, and really your conclusion is, 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 is my conclusion from, from this webinar. So much happening, so many good practices that we can share, learn for, from and quickly implement uh, in building back better. So thank you so much for, for reminding us uh, of that. And thank you for joining us. Uh, our next speaker, Ms. Uh, Angeline Chand, who is the team leader of the programs from the Pacific Disability Forum in Fiji. Delighted to have another Pacific voice. Over to you. We can see you, but not hear you yet. Greetings from the Pacific Disability Forum. Is that better? We can hear you, but it's very faint. Oh dear. Greetings from the Pacific Disability Forum. Is that better? Thank you so much. You, you can okay. shout as loud as you like. Thank you. Uh, greetings from the Pacific Disability Forum. It's a pleasure to be in this webinar uh, highlighting the voices of the Pacific. But firstly, I would like to thank our distinguished panelists for your very rich insight to the various topics. For the Pacific Disability Forum, prior to COVID-19, we already had a Pacific uh, emergency response unit, which meant that we had already established partnerships with organizations uh, to deal with natural disasters and climate change. So with COVID-19, we were able to get into that platform again, working with a different cluster group, such as on food security, livelihoods, education, health, the subcluster on gender-based violence. Um, being serving on this uh, different cluster groups allowed us the opportunity to promote the twin track approach, uh, getting up because the cluster groups are made up of government representatives, uh, donor partners, NGOs, and the civil society. So it's about promoting disability inclusion, how they could better include persons with disabilities in whatever interventions they were doing. And we were also reminding the different partners of the cluster groups when they are working at the national level to ensure the voices of national disabled people's organization. Uh, we've also worked on core documents that has been shared 
to our partners to help them for their inclusion of the persons with disabilities in their different programs. And we have also developed messaging that organizations could use. And as our colleague from Samoa highlighted, uh, most of the governments are promoting the use of sign language during national uh, news and they are also paying for sign language interpreters. We are also working on easy to read, um, easy to read versions of the doc of the core documents. And we have also partnered with UNFPA. Uh, as we know that UNFPA in times of emergencies uh, distributes dignity kits to women. So they have come to us in this COVID period to, to request women with disabilities to assess those dignity kits to ensure what else in addition to their normal dignity kits would be useful and vital for women with disabilities. Once that list is finalized, once the, the kits are available, it will be distributed to women and girls with disabilities in the Pacific. Uh, we have also um, started on working with a situation report, collecting stories on from DPOs, what's worked well, what has been their challenges, and how the Pacific Disability Forum would be able to assist them. Finally, we also have a photo blog on our Facebook page where we are trying to collect stories of persons with disabilities uh, to ensure the voices of Pacific persons with disabilities are not lost so that they are able to share their experience on this COVID-19 period. So I guess um, for us, um, a key message that we would like to leave is uh, as all the speakers have said, we do a lot of good job, but we need to share what's happening. And I think the sharing of that information, the voices of Pacific persons with disabilities is very vital. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very vital in the, indeed. And certainly count on us to help you amplify uh, those voices and to share the stories that, that you are collecting. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to go all the way to the other side of the world to my colleague, uh, Georgia Dominic, who works in the disability team in the executive office of the United Nations Secretary General and has been one of the driving forces of the United Nations Disability Inclusion Strategy that we're, many of us are working on, including Valerie in Nepal. So Georgia, over to you and thank you for joining us so late. Thank you very much. I should uh, mention that I'm actually in New Zealand at the moment, so <laughs> it's, the, it's the afternoon here. Um, but really, thank you very much for inviting the disability team of the Executive Office of the Secretary General to um, to join you in this discussion today. And it is a big ask to come after um, so many incredible speakers. And I mean, if I can pull one. Um, you know, one key thread that runs through all of this, I think, and um, and Angie said it very well just now, is, uh, you know, that we have to learn from each other. Um, and, you know, a coordinated pro approach is really uh, key to achieving disability inclusion. Um, in terms of the role of the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, that's really one of the, um, the areas of focus that we have. The strategy was launched in uh, June 2019, and um, it it was established because it addressed that across the UN system we have, while we do have pockets of good practice, we do have a number of gaps and challenges in relation to disability inclusion. Um, and so the strategy it really tries to lay a foundation for how together we can uh, work towards um, a, a roadmap or it presents a roadmap for how we can achieve that. Um, and we've heard uh, across all of the speakers today um, elements that are really addressed in the strategy that we know are also relevant to a COVID-19 response and recovery that is inclusive of persons with disabilities, whether you're talking about employment, or accessibility, consultation with persons with disabilities, um, communications, you know, all of these are, are elements that the strategy uh, touches upon and it has really provided a foundation for um, how we can think about a COVID-19 response. But I wanted to um, maybe pull two, uh, two elements out in particular. The first one is leadership. Um, and the strategy really aims to bring a high level political commitment and leadership um, on disability inclusion and to drive that conversation forward. Um, and, you know, I think that we can see in terms of COVID-19, what has that meant? 
Um, well, we've had, as was mentioned in the beginning, the Secretary General's policy brief on persons with disabilities and COVID-19 response. Uh, you know, this is one of um, a, a number of policy briefs and one of the first on persons with disabilities specifically. Um, the policy brief has also um, uh, has also um, pushed forward the um, the development of a letter by member states, which is reiterating a number of the recommendations that are included in the brief um, and calling on a disability response. So it's really pushing forward um, the importance of leadership and highlighting disability inclusion as uh, as a key issue that we need to be focused on in this response and recovery. And then just to go back to the point on coordination um, and to share with you that, you know, one of the aims of the strategy is to support coordinated implementation on disability inclusion. Um, and so in relation to that, um, Under Secretary General Menendez, who's the Secretary General's Senior Advisor on Policy, has established a time bound emergency working group um, of entities to coordinate our engagement and response to uh, COVID-19 and to ensure persons with disabilities are included in mainstream response and recovery efforts. And then also uh, entities have been requested to report on how they are uh, including persons with disabilities and how they plan to include persons with disabilities in uh, in their COVID-19 actions, both uh, that are occurring now and in the future. So I think um, it's really an opportunity to uh, have a, a system-wide uh, view of what is going on and also to really uh, benefit from the um, from the many lessons learned and the excellent practices that are uh, that are going on across the system. Thank you so much, and 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 really, we look forward. All of us uh, on this uh, on this uh, webinar look forward to to working to translate some of this political mo momentum into real action, into real investments. Of course, through the United Nations and through our, our member states. Uh, the the last person who uh, who is going to intervene is uh, Miss Dipwali Sharma uh, from Defway Project, uh, Defway Project officer at uh, Nawal uh, Parasi Association of the Deaf in Nepal. Now, because of some technical issues that all of you have, have, have probably noticed, um, we're going to, we, we have a, a, a pre-recorded message from her uh, to share with us. So let's go ahead with the message. Um, being a deaf woman and mother, myself and interested to be a social worker, I chose my own sector, the deaf sector. For the reason of many deaf people who are not achieving quality sign language interpreters, I collect vital information and share to deaf community via social media. Most local government provide live Nepali sign language interpreters on their official briefing. However, However, we are still advocating with central government to uh, make critical information accessible to deaf community through live sign language interpreter. We are also advocating for video relay service. Utilizing COVID-19 crisis and home quarantine, I have begun basic Nepali sign language tutorial online. In addition, I'm also translating Nepali songs into NSL to help quarantine deaf people get some entertainment and deal with mental health issue so that everyone can easily access my classes and entertainment video on Facebook and YouTube. Our, v our friends with disability are also working in current issues like accessible quarantine, isolation, safety kits for home quarantine, disabled people. We are we all, we all are trying to collaborate with related organizations and government bodies to provide immediate aid for deaf and persons with disability affected by this pandemic. The central government has given authority and responsibility of relief and distribution to local government bodies. Local government representatives are not familiar about the acute need of disabled people. People with multiple disabilities, severe disability like hemophilia, spinal cord injuries, mental illness and those who need long-term treatment, care and medication every day are mostly affected because of this pandemic, yet vulnerable to relief aid provider. 
We are collaborating with local government bodies in recognition of those in severe need, providing them with medicine, medical equipment, and general relief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, 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 that, uh, for that message. So, difference that brings us to to the end of the second segment of of, of our of our session, and and we uh, we, we had planned uh, some time now to to go into questions, uh, but unfortunately we we run a little bit uh, out of time, and I want to hear very much from Senator Montian Buntan, who always really is so so good at at, at, at distilling the kind of conversation that we have just had. But I would like to mention that uh, all the questions we have gathered we will provide you with the answers to that. We have questions from Madame Zhang uh, Heidi uh, regarding China's disability inclusive measures, uh, uh, especially about protecting uh, the health and interests of persons with disabilities during the pandemic, including access to, to testing and medical treatment. We will get you some answers on that. We've had a, a number of questions about data, disability disaggregated data, longer term, as Valerie was talking about in surveys, et cetera, but also short term in terms of the pe people affected during the crisis. We will come back to you on that. We have questions on, on, on how developing countries that maybe don't have all of the technology can still uh, uh, make technology a part of the solution. And, and we will definitely go to Kawamori-san for some insights there. Uh, and then we've had questions on about jobs, whether whether persons with disabilities should now be prioritized uh, as job seekers in this time uh, and many, many other other questions. So we will answer them all and we will come back to to you on those uh, uh, on those questions. Now it gives me a great pleasure to invite uh, Senator Montian Buntan, who is a senator of the Parliament of Thailand and member of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, also an ESCAP champion for the Asian and Pacific Decade of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, Senator Montian uh, is going to give us some reflections on, on, on our discussions and, and some of the insights on how we can move forward as a community in protecting and empowering persons uh, with, with disabilities. Uh, uh, dear Senator Montian, over, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Zahidi. Uh, it's an honor for me to be given this opportunity. And uh, I think we have gone through a very comprehensive uh, discussion and, uh, and all of them are very fruitful. I would not try to uh, reinvent what uh, people have said, but I will just probably more, more or less recollect or reflect what I understand, and uh, perhaps give uh, a short bit of, of my my own reflection. Uh, we all know that uh, with or without COVID-19 pandemic, uh, persons with disabilities have always been uh, left behind uh, as one of the leaders in the disability field uh, used to say in the United Nations in New York, that persons with disabilities are often the first to be the to be forgotten and the last to be remembered. Um, the COVID-19 exacerbate uh, such exclusion even more. You probably know that uh, most, if not all, governments around the world uh, follow medical advices uh, uh, for social or physical distancing and th this could also mean a further isolation and exclusion for persons with disabilities. Uh, we touch upon the need to uh, accelerate and to take this opportunity to accelerate uh, the disability inclusion at all levels, uh, whether at the policy level the operational measure level and and also uh, in terms of budget allocation. Uh, I I follow quite uh, closely and uh, I can see that uh, many of us are concerned that governments, uh, many governments, I, I would say all governments often work uh, from the silo, meaning 
uh, each ministry or departments, they all have their own agenda. But with this regard, uh, disability inclusion in, in, in the context of uh, uh, responses to a COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we need more effort than ever to uh, strengthen uh, government uh, to, to work together uh, and to ensure more uh, efficiency and effectiveness uh, given the fact that uh, the whole economy is is being uh, affected uh, either because of the slowdown or lockdown or uh, uh, pausing of a lot of econ economic activities. So there's a need more than ever for government uh, to to work in concert, to work together uh, across uh, ministries and sectors. Uh, we also uh, heard uh, from many of us uh, that uh, several measures uh, need to be addressed. Uh, we're talking about medical health services, rehabilitation services uh, that could not be uh, uh, put uh, to to pause even during this time of crisis because persons with disabilities need ongoing services and uh, and uh, access to uh, health services related to the pandemic itself is also of great importance. Uh, the other uh, measures to promote and protect the rights of persons with disabilities, whether it's uh, social protection schemes, employment, uh, or, or even cash transfer, uh, the, the need for disability, uh, the, the recognition of persons with disabilities uh, that have uh, always been in need of, of uh, assistance uh, is probably more so than uh, during the time without crisis. Uh, the, we, we heard good examples, best practice of uh, partnership among uh, organizations of persons with disabilities civil society organizations, local government, private sectors. Uh, especially uh, we heard from the Pacific, uh, Bangladesh or India, uh, or even in China. Uh, we, we are beginning to, uh, to see that what we have been advocating for several years are finally uh, being proven the reality that uh, that uh, persons with disabilities need to be involved, uh, uh, and, and especially uh, at the implement level, uh, at the local level, uh, which all and most uh, implementation take place. Uh, uh, as a result, persons with disabilities are not only just recipient of, of help uh, or care, but tech uh, active role uh, in participating in uh, the decision making, in uh, forming guidelines and, and how assistance and services could be provided. And, uh, and, and that's uh, because uh, sometimes uh, uh, people are not allowed to uh, travel so far. So it's almost like uh, the situation that uh, uh, local action has been tested and uh, the contribution from persons with disabilities and their organizations are also being proven uh, effective in, in this manner. Uh, we also heard the uh, reflection uh, 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 and, and also the need for information and communication technology that needs to be uh, utilized uh, more uh, given the fact that we are uh, experiencing social distancing. Uh, however, because uh, of lack of accessibility, uh, still uh, being repeated over and over again, uh, we will probably see that at this time or moment uh, of crisis, uh, ICT accessibility uh, needs to be uh, even further addressed. And uh, I, I appreciate uh, ITU for taking uh, several initiatives, but we also would like to see 
uh, emerging, uh, I, I hope that it's still emerging economy of the uh, this part of the world that will contribute to uh, good practices in enhancing accessibility from the private sectors, especially uh, when Mr. Uh, Kawamori mentioned that ITU is uh, the only uh, UN agency with uh, private industry membership. And uh, we have seen in many cases that uh, uh, implementing accessibility is often more uh, possible through uh, the private business implementation uh, or, or uh, living example. So we hope that uh, uh, more is yet to come uh, to, to make uh, ICT accessibility uh, uh, the, the reality so as uh, persons with disabilities will not be locked in isolation uh, during this pandemic. And uh, last, I, I would like to remind us that uh, many, many thinkers or academias are trying to predict that we are at risk of disintegration, uh, uh, fragmentation, uh, or, or, or reverse glo globalization, and uh, that we may be at risk of t turning ourselves against uh, uh, each other. But, but I'm on quite on the opposite. I, I think uh, the, the history of humankind has proven that when we face difficulties, uh, we, the only way we can go through this is through a human uh, solidarity, collaboration, uh, taking action together. Uh, and and uh, in this case, disability inclusion is now or never chance. Uh, and and uh, COVID-19 may be an alarm for us to really uh, tell ourselves and the world that uh, without th taking this opportunity to strengthen uh, the concept of inclusion, the concept of collaboration, uh, or even repeating uh, the phrase that was so popular 20 years ago, 30 years ago, think globally and act locally. Uh, uh, it's still uh, not too outdated. Uh, I think we may not have another chance uh, because if we miss this opportunity to reiterate the need for a global regional solidarity and to take concerted action for further collaboration, partnership and, and inclusion uh, of all aspects of development, we may not have another chance because there's a, a great risk of uh, physical isolation, social exclusion uh, that, that could never return back to uh, before. So it, it's, I believe, uh, this webinar really reminds us to, to, to ask ourselves to re rethink that we want to create new normal or, or we want to be just passive, uh, uh, passive citizens of the new normal. And I believe that the disability community and our friends, our brothers and sisters, throughout this region and throughout the world uh, have our answers that we we want to be part of it. We want to be part of the of the game changer. We would like to be creator. We would like to be contributor and active participants in this uh, uh, wave to new normals. More power to all of you, and I hope that we uh, we consistently give up on giving up. Thank you very much, uh, Kaveh and, and all Thank you so much, Senator Montian. Thank you very much, and I, and I really, it's 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 the it's the perfect uh, conclusion. Uh, this is our opportunity to accelerate disability inclusion, as you said. Uh, it, and having listened to everybody around this webinar today, I'm more convinced than ever that maybe COVID has helped us to make sure that persons with disabilities are remembered or have been remembered but now is definitely our opportunity to accelerate disability uh, inclusion 
and make sure it is an absolute foundation for this building back better that is becoming the new mantra. So colleagues, uh, friends, uh, you've been extremely patient, and but we've come to the end of our, our webinar. And on behalf of ESCAP, I would like to thank all of you for your participation and for your uh, inputs. Before you go, uh, we did want to, to, to remind you that um, uh, as Victor requested, as many of you have mentioned, as the stories you have said really make it uh, an obligation, um, we, uh, we will make sure that all of the material that we can get our hands on uh, that you will share will be on ESCAP's Make the Right Real web portal, which is maketherightreal.net. It already houses a lot of resources, but we will make sure that now there are some there is a COVID specific section there that can really help us uh, to share very quickly some of the success stories that many of you have pointed to. So we will certainly do that. We will also make available a video of this session. We, we know that uh, there have been technical difficulties. We thank you for for, for staying with us uh, and sorry for those technical difficulties, but it happens. So we will make sure a video of the session is available for any, for you to share with your networks uh, as as you as you see fit, so that we make sure we maintain uh, the 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 momentum. Uh, we will also make sure that the unanswered questions will be answered. We will come back to you and make sure to get the answers for the many questions that you have posed. And we thank you for those thoughtful questions. I know many of them were already answered as the discussants came in, uh, but we'll make sure to get back to all of you uh, as, as much as we, we possibly uh, can. Uh, of course, we will be happy to organize more of these sessions. Come back to us, give us your reflections, give us your feedback, and we will together uh, move, move forward. So please do come back and let us know what is useful at this time to help amplify your voices, as we hope to do for the Voices of the Pacific that, that we heard, or to, vote, to, to help to, to distribute the, the guidelines and the many very specific uh, things that have been generated during COVID. Uh, uh, across the Asia Pacific uh, region. So so please come back and share with us. Learning from each other, as Georgia said, is is a vital part of what we we hope to to achieve. And lastly, I really want to thank uh, the ESCAP team that that has put this together. An extraordinary effort, and I cannot name all of them. They know who they are. The, the, the team in the social development division, the interpreters who've been magnificent, the technical team that has been, been trying so desperately to keep us uh, going and to overcome all the glitches. Really, we, we're so grateful to all of you for the time you've put into to, to, to making this really uh, a superbly interesting morning possible for, for all of us. So, so thank you. Thank you to all of you who joined and we hope to see you again around this setting or another setting soon.